You are listening to Access to Perspectives Conversations. My name is Joe Havman, and with me today is Paola. Hi, Paola. Hi there. So, Paola Mazuzzo, Mazuzzo, sorry. Mazuzzo, Mazuzzo, yes. <laughs> Italian, for those who can mm-hmm. guess. Um, yeah, we met a couple of years ago. We were introduced by our joint, um, uh, common friend, now um, sadly deceased for two years now, John Tennant. We get, we are going to talk about him and, and his influence on both our work in a bit. Um, but starting with, um, just tell us, so we're here to talk about open science explicitly. And those who have listened to this podcast for a while probably know some of my interpretations with open science is, and I think what you and I also share is, at the end of the day, we're talking about good research practice. And that also, how can that be facilitated with digital tools? And yet there's so much to talk about when it comes to open science. And we'd love to hear your take on on the topics and what what brings you here, what are you passionate about, why you're engaged in open science discussions. You present and moderate a lot and facilitate a lot of the conversations for open science and open access. So yeah, who, who are you and what are you doing here? No, like how friendly. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here because <laughs> I'm here because you invited me kindly to be here. Right. Yeah. Um, no. I'm very no. glad <laughs> for this opportunity, Joe. Um, so yes, I'm Paola. I am uh, Italian in the sense that I was uh, born and raised in Italy, uh, but I emigrated around uh, 10 years ago, almost 11. So I've been living in Belgium since then. Um, I live in Ghent, uh, eating chocolate and uh, French fries. <laughs> yeah. And this, this, is, this is the town, the city where I did my PhD in health sciences and bioinformatics. And actually, uh, it's where my love for my passion for uh, open science and open research practices in general um, actually was was really born. Um, I I clearly remember the first time around uh, when I was finished with my first research article and I had to publish it. And um, I clearly remember not liking the whole uh, revision process, but my supervisor telling me that that's how the peer review works and you need to stick with it and it doesn't matter how long it takes and it doesn't matter how rude people are, you have to do what they ask you to do because it's super important that you publish in that journal. I clearly remember him uh, telling me that we had to sign a, um, a copyright transfer uh, agreement, which I found was very peculiar. Mm-hmm. And I clearly remember uh, um, telling, having him telling me that after we were done publishing the paper, uh, we didn't have access to it anymore, which I found, uh, I, I really thought that this is hilarious. What's happening here? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I mean, and, and I love, but it's really so sad when you think about it. Like, what we did all the work, and now we can't even I, anymore. Like. I spent all these months doing the research. I, I spent months writing the research, which is also something that I was and still am not super good at. Um, I spent six months waiting for those reviews coming back. I spent another two weeks uh, to um, do all those modifications. Finally, the article was accepted. I had to transfer the copyright because it didn't belong to us anymore, basically, to the authors. And then in the end, yeah, my professor didn't tell me that I could pay an extra fee to make it open access. And I didn't know how things worked, to be honest. I was really blissfully ignorant in that sense. But after that, I realized, oh crap, it's now behind the paywall. I can't even have access to it anymore. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, my, my institution had access to, to the you know, subscription of the journal, so I could have access. But outside of that, I couldn't have access to it anymore. And that's where I thought, OK, I want to understand how these all things work. I want to understand how it is that it is this way, uh, why is it was born and uh, constructed this way. And when I realized that it didn't make a lot of sense, um, I actually wanted to, you know, start advocating for a change. And this was actually uh, at the beginning of my PhD, but it was only in 2015, I believe it was, that I went to to an event in Brussels, where I actually met John for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, And I heard for the first time in my life, and also my life as a PhD student and as a researcher, people talking about open access, people talking about an alternative, um, you know, a different way to do things than what we were, and we unfortunately still are used to. 
Um, and those were the years indeed where I started advocating for open science uh, and I really wanted to become an open science champion. Of course, I have changed a lot uh, since then. Also my ideas around open science and open access have changed, have transformed, which I think it's really important and relevant because that also means that I, I listen uh, uh, enough <laughs> to many, many people and many perspectives mm. like, uh, like this podcast, for example, tries to do, right? Uh, bringing different opinions, different points of view, different needs, uh, uh, different challenges, and uh, try to, to capture all of that uh, within the open science uh, complexity framework. It's, it's not an easy task, but it's really important. I don't know if that gives a little bit of a background. Uh, Very much, yeah, thank you. And how would you say, because you said your perception changed in what open, open science and open access can achieve and should serve from your first encounters towards, or, or maybe how, like, can you pinpoint the changes in your view on open science and open access? Or is it now, or you can also just explain maybe to us what open science and open access mean to you today and how it can be achieved in a way that is serving several stakeholders as we've encountered yeah. over the years. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, when I was younger and I was still a PhD student, uh, um, in those first years of my advocacy, I was very much focusing on uh, open access and how do we make sure that, um, you know, the, the papers are free to read. And I really thought that if we did that, at least the open access problem would be gone. Mm. Um, and in the years, uh, I believe that my perspective on the all open research practices has changed and it needed to change because I was too much focused on, uh, you know, the, the issues of my field, the issues that we researchers uh, uh, face in Europe, which might be very much different from uh, the challenges of people uh, in other parts of the world. Um, so I believe that when I stopped, you know, reiterating what the problem for us was, but I started listening more to the challenges that other people were facing. I also realized that to make something free on the web doesn't necessarily mean that that something serves the right purpose, which is to serve society. And that's where I also started to, to realize that you cannot have open research practices if you do not make sure that whatever is free is also accessible for everybody. The two things are not necessarily the same. Um, if you don't come up with sustainable ways uh, for people to make those resources for free. So for example, I used to think that, okay, if we have article processing charges um, models where we pay a fee and then we make sure that our paper is open, you know, I, I, I can sleep good at night. My, my paper is, is, is free, but not everybody is, is capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah, because money is scarce, because resources are not equally distributed around the world. I don't have to tell you that. And the other thing that uh, I learned, especially in the last two to three years, is that we cannot have this conversation around open science if we also don't talk about how researchers are assessed around it. Mm -hmm. If we keep researchers, uh, um, if we keep evaluating the way we do research and researchers, you know, because of the publishing uh, high uh, journal uh, impact factor, uh, high impact factor journals, or because uh, um, they publish a lot of papers. If these are the things that uh, we keep uh, uh, deeming relevant, we can talk about open science all we want. Nobody will ever embrace these open research practices. So now I would say, if I look now at uh, my thoughts about open science with respect to, I don't know, five or six years ago, um, these thoughts are much broader um, and they, they also, I've also realized that it's a very complex thing to do where you need to make sure that the needs and the challenges, the wishes of different people are all taken into account if you really want to have open and global science. Mm. So a rather complex thing, but, but it's really important that we do it. Yeah, I agree. And also mentioning article processing charges, like what I often hear from articulary researchers when I, 
And when I ask them about what they know about open science already, then they say, oh yeah, we know about open access. We had that seminar and we know that our library pays for the APCs. It's like, yeah, but it's, first of all, that's not what open access is trying to achieve mm -hmm. or is meant for. That's just one way to finance the access. And yes, there's costs that are incurred. They need to be covered, but they certainly don't exceed any cover of hundreds of euros or dollars. Yeah. And some some stakeholders charge just that for only profitable reasons. And that's the only reason. Absolutely. Um, um, whereas also if you're willing to pay that APC, like and or ask your library to pay it, don't you think the money is taken away from something else, like human resources? Yeah. And so I mean, it's probably not the researcher's responsibility to consider all of that. But to say, oh, my library pays for that is one thing. And then, yeah, I made an effort to, to provide for open access. And yes, there's the pressure to publish in, in certain journals. Mm. And what I see in, as my responsibility as a trainer and consultant is to provide options. There's more options that are available. And yes, we need to inform also the management, the research managers, the decision makers, the career uh advisors your career centers to not assess by where people publish and this is also what i learned or what 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 was made explicit to me by john like he he was the first who i encountered to deliberately remove the journal's names from his cv and list of mm -hmm. references in his cv mm -hmm. and this is what i'm preaching ever since it doesn't matter where you publish it the only thing that matters is what you publish and that's yeah. your research and the venue should only matter to a degree of that it covers the same scope of research that you're presenting and that's the only measure yeah absolutely yeah and this this also makes me think indeed that um my how shall i put this my strong feelings for the current publishing system are very much borrowed from from john in the sense that uh, hearing him talk about uh, how the whole uh, scientific production system works uh, and uh, hearing him saying very explicitly that it's, you know, a huge pile of nonsense. <laughs> Let me say nonsense here. Um, it really clicked with me. And uh, especially in the last few years, we kept uh, telling each other that how, how we could allow so much control uh, to be with those uh, profit uh, um, publishing uh, houses and how we could play this game where at the end of the day, researchers have no say whatsoever in how they would like to publish, in what they would like to publish, in which format and with which money. It's absolutely unbelievable. Such a stupid, stupid game. And it, it, it also reminds me that um, when I did uh, do uh, some of the talks around this and I had to you know, tell people uh, why the impact factor doesn't make any sense. I think nowadays uh, you need to tell this less to people. I, I start to think that and I start to see that many more people realize why it's such a stupid metric. Um, back uh, three, four years ago, this was perhaps not always the case. And when I had to, you know, to present uh, and tell people why this was this was bad and this was wrong, and I would send uh, my slides to John, and he would say, "Oh, this is so brilliant." Please use all your Italian fury to tell them that this is a pile of bullshit and that we shouldn't do this and we shouldn't play this system. Mm. And it's, I mean, it's so true and it's so obvious and yet so difficult for, for this radical transformation to happen. Mm. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, it's right. I mean, I also find myself not have to explain what the impact factor actually says. Sometimes I make that an exercise in my workshops, like mm -hmm. put it up, do the math, and then tell me how that's a measure for quality. It's not, it's, like, not. it's just not. It's it wasn't not. built for that. It's a measure for impact, but only for that one journal you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. it, end of the story. And it was a measure for librarians to choose which journals to subscribe to, but we are way, way beyond that now with a mass of research output that's being produced every yeah. day, really. So um, solution-oriented is my favorite. <laughs> so what 
what's a better practice then? So what, what are the low hanging fruits? How can a researcher easily comply with open science principles without stretching and risking their career? That's also one of John's um, favorite sayings, like you don't have to break the bank to publish open access. There are easy mm -hmm. ways to do that. And also free of charge or very low charge if you want to spend a budget on APCs. And that for, also if you want to kind of as an institution or a researcher, research department, if you want to use your budget to also invest in open scholarly infrastructure because there are mm -hmm. costs to be covered. The only question is who's, who's gonna cover this cost and to what extent? Like, it doesn't mean that only the researchers have to cover all of, of all of the expenses there's other stakeholders but but my since we're so yeah I, I mean i'm very closely working with the researchers and i think the researchers are the ones who are at the end of the day are making the decisions where they publish and as you said like if the research assessment wouldn't change they will continue to be forced to publish in high impact factor journals no matter what yeah. the policy says or the, the institutional policy is also slowly changing things to for the most part, I would guess, as of DORA, um, the San Francisco Declaration of Open Research Assessment, or on research assessment, not necessarily open, but it's very much open in practice. Um, and I think the only thing they say is like, do not make your decisions and assessment dependent on the John impact factor because it's not a quality measure. There's better ways to do that. And the better ways in doing that is actually showcasing practices of institutions from around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, but then the question again is, what, what can a PhD student do to, to serve open science and not to have to break the bank to publish and to convince their supervisors? Because most PhD students tell me, oh, I totally understand and comply with what you're saying, Joe, it's just my supervisor asked me to do the opposite. So what should I do? Yeah. So um, the preprints are very cool. They don't necessarily answer uh, uh, the question for full uh, open access compliance, because of course, when you post a preprint, that means the peer review still has to happen. And that means that, you know, indeed that the, your manuscript is not peer reviewed yet. Um, it hasn't passed, you know, the scrutiny from the scientific community. Um, I somehow think, <laughs> however, that the diversity of the review that you can collect through preprint is already by definition what we try to achieve with open science, right? It's not only a matter of open, it's also a matter of transparent, collaborative, um, you know, diverse. So collecting um, reviews from a bunch of people, <laughs> researchers from the web and not the usual two, three that you don't even know who they are and it's all inside a black box. There is no control and no scrutiny. I would argue that it's a much better way to do peer review than what we are used to. But nevertheless, so preprints are very cool. Um, and usually uh, it's, it's very easy and there are different uh, indeed the servers you, you, you know very well. Um, depending on what you want to, to publish, depending on, on, your, on your discipline. I have published preprints in the past, and I've also seen that, uh, at least in the life sciences, for example, where my professional background is, um, they are becoming now way more uh, common and uh, used than uh, what it was like five, six, or even 10 years ago when I started my PhD, right? Mm -hmm. um, and with the, with the pandemic, with the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, we have seen that. Uh, there was this rise of preprints. Now, if it is there to stay, it's a little bit hard for me to tell, um, especially because, as you were saying before, it's also important what we put in the research assessment. If I have my curriculum and I need to apply for a grant, I need to apply for uh, a teaching position, uh, promotion, whatever, can I write in those that I do have a preprint? I understand it's not a peer-reviewed article, but it's still a story that tells uh, which type of research I have done and to which extent that research has value. So for me, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Will that preprint be considered with the same way of a peer-reviewed article? Maybe not, but it is an output and it should be there, if you ask me. Another thing, of course, it's green open access. So um, try to uh, post uh, a, a, a version of, of, your, of your article uh, whenever compliant with the journal where you're going to publish um, in, uh, um, uh, how do you say this, uh, institutional repositories. 
um, which again brings the you know the question to how can institutions make sure that their open access and publishing infrastructure are actually sustainable and it all boils down to how do we make sure that we prioritize our investment efforts mm -hmm. where is your research institution actually using the most of the budget for this in making sure you have librarians open research infrastructure in making sure you have uh, you know data stewards that also take care of of the all the research data management part, which we could also open, but it's an entirely different discussion. Or is the budget spent on incredibly high subscription because once again, you know, you are unfortunately play, playing the game. I, I know it's it's difficult to talk about money and I wish I didn't have to talk about money, but at the end of the day, you need money to, to build the solutions that are sustainable, right? Mm. And I don't know if this is actually happening. Uh, within institutions. Um, but yes, going back to what PhD students can do at the end of the day without breaking the bank, I think preprints and green open access are great things to do. Um, and in the broader open science terms, also, of course, opening up their data, if possible, uh, opening up their code that they use to analyze their data. Um, but, you know, I think it's also beyond that, uh, uh, what really helped me towards the end of my PhD was also to keep uh, like uh, open notebook where I would just uh, also tell the people uh, the stuff that I did uh, that did not necessarily lead uh, to a publication. Because, again, we need to cherry pick what we're going to publish, right? Mm. If I come up with a null result, uh, no journal would be interested. And the, the output of months and months of research will stay in a drawer because it's not good enough to be published. But yet there is a lot of information in there. So I, I, I think I am talking about many, many things now all together, but that's also something that PhD students can do if they believe that what they are doing is valuable to some extent because their hypothesis did not come out true or because you know they tried as an experiment with two or three factors that were not supposed to be together and the outcome was not the, what they expected, it's still very valuable information. Uh -huh. Some, if Imagine if somebody else reads that and they say, oh, I wanted to try this, but look, it doesn't seem to be working. Maybe I will change this factor with this other factor and maybe the experiment will turn out. Exactly. If you don't find that, that information anywhere, uh, in Google, on the web or whatever, then it's all a waste of money, right? So that, that's also something that researchers should do more and could do more. Uh, telling each other what they do way beyond the PDF in the, in the, in the journal. Mm. I think it's, it's in the 2021, 20, are we, 2022? It's still ridiculous that months and months of effort in research needs to be trapped in a PDF with a page limitation, uh, reference limitation, uh, certain amount of figures. It's just, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I think it makes sense in the sense that um, journal articles tell a story. It's a lot about Absolutely. storytelling and storytelling is a way for humans to communicate with each other. So there's like a beginning an end and an outcome, like a solution, something that's being presented. There's actors and um, molecules or people. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of storytelling in a way, but I agree. Like, and I think that's the beauty with preprints because preprints are meant to be versioned based on the feedback mm -hmm. that's coming in and also um, continuous research by the co authors and co contributors. So I see preprints more like Google Docs or living documents of some sort, which yes. can continue to evolve as long as there's money for the research to be done or as, as long as the same group of people and contributors, which can also grow or shrink over time, but the same project is being worked on and information is being edited. There's also now initiatives like Science Octopus where to detach or to, to inform the, the kind of manuscript version, which again like serves storytelling and um, us in communication and easy comprehension um, to interlink the underlying data sets to also update and version those to add more images like you said a mm -hmm. nation of informative illustrations and we have more to offer why shouldn't should we hide that and yes we can 
stuff with some journals in the section for what is it called accompanying resources or um there's a there's several words for that or uh, yeah anyways there's so some journals provide that section but then it's it's just a lump of additional stuff that's also linked to the research where i think each research outcome be it a data set an image a graph that was designed or a text deserves its own standing and can also evolve further. And then we like, should we talk about FAIR a little bit? Because FAIR was established mm -hmm. as a best practice or principle with being findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable for data sets. But I think couldn't couldn't the same principles be applied also for manuscripts and presentations on any research outcome, really? That's what I I think so. I think so, yeah. I mean, uh, um, there are some things uh, um, like the interoperable uh, um, concept that you might think, okay, this applies maybe to some uh, uh, digital objects that it's a little bit richer, right? Because mm -hmm. when you say interoperable, you mean that uh, uh, that specific data set can then be opened uh, between different machines uh, and that it's readable not only from a person, from the human point of view, but also from the machine point of view. Mm -hmm. So, um, Maybe that aspect there, it's more about indeed uh, data sets uh, as we know them, huh? what we usually uh, mean when we say data sets. But I think that the fair principles can indeed be applied to every research object that we produce. Um, would it be a protocol, would it be a data set, would it be software? The fair principles mm -hmm. uh, have been actually, uh, I'm not going to say extended, but really repurposed entirely just for, for software because uh, uh, the code that you write to analyze uh, specific data sets and to answer specific research questions yeah. should also make sure that people know how to find it that it's clear how you can access it, what is the license, to which extent can I repurpose and reuse it and extend it and modify it. Um, it should be interoperable, so that means you should have a license that it's also open and that can be run across different machines and indeed reusable, as I said before, how can I uh, use it again for, for other purposes and for other research questions. And it's, I, I believe the... Sorry? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I just wanted to add to that and also um, programmers and data scientists can finally gain credit for putting work into coding because much code is being used by other researchers in the biosciences, wind subjects, whatever, um, or also um, social sciences and humanities. And this is what, what I astonished me when I learned about it a couple of years ago that there's hardly any recognition of code being used or algorithms being yeah. used for the people who actually programmed that. And that's now being addressed also with a fair principles to extend or rather with a, what's it called, like the credit taxonomy to acknowledge yeah. any contribution to a research project results presentation kind of thing yeah that's cool yeah so it, it, it boils down also of course to how you make sure that software uh, citation practices are in place and uh, data citation as well right mm -hmm. so uh, the biggest uh, the, the major thing to, to that you need to do is that findable part which is where you don't just take uh, your research output let's say the piece of software you have written and you put it on a on a repository but you also make sure that it's in a repository where it gets its own DOI, the digital object identifier. And uh, like that, you can link uh, the DOI of your research article with the DOI of your software. And each piece becomes a little bit independent from each other, but yet part uh, of, of a major uh, story, right? Of a bigger story. And then people can choose indeed which parts they want to, to cite you and to give you credit for which. I believe from, I mean, an assessment point of view makes a lot of sense because there is way more to doing research than just writing the article and publishing it. Yeah, and it serves like the whole workflow, the, all the work that goes into a research project for everyone who contributes to being acknowledged and also possibly assessed for the quality of work, but only based on really best research practices and not some mm -hmm. uh, metrics or misconceived metrics that was invented for another purpose. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so the future looks bright. <laughs> well, well, it looks, um, 
promising. On paper, it, it on paper it looks really promising, right? Mm. If you if you really look at what has happened, uh, I mean, I'm I'm amazed now when I when I do talks around open science and I am or I do workshops, uh, and I think you can also testify that um, there is no more convincing to be done. People know why this is important. People see why we cannot afford to lock science behind paywalls. We cannot afford to, for research outcomes to not be accessible, discoverable, reusable. It's a huge waste of money. It's a huge waste of human resources, of human capital, if you want. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that um, there are major parts of, of, of researchers that still need to be convinced about this important transition to happen and now it's now time that we actually do the job and i mean for example the the the, the final recommendations on open science from unesco has, has clearly shown this there's no no more convincing to be done and we are slowly move, moving towards a common understanding of open science where we know what are the major elements that need to be there but somebody now needs to sit down and actually make sure that this is implemented and that it becomes a reality yeah I think that's what, what I've observed as much as I preach fair principles, open access principles, what other principles. The, the, yeah, the, the explaining and convincing is one thing, and there's a lot of agreement, as you said. But now people always uh, uh, say then, yes, and now how? And, and now how? Yeah. There's no answer to that, unfortunately, like not in a workshop mm -hmm. like I um, provide for, because you have people from, even when they would be, like for change pure from the same discipline they all work on different projects and different aspects of one project all of which need specific fair requirements to like not only on the project level but also on the research item level so it's quite mm -hmm. detailed what we're calling for when we ask for fair principles so therefore i don't think there's any major or general recommendations that can be place as an example but you have to actually declinate i don't know if that's the right term in english no native speaker here <laughs> um, <laughs> but you have to actually yeah i mean there is lists and and approaches how can you or what do you need to consider like machine and human readability and then how like what what data item are we looking at how can it be made both human and machine readable what algorithms do we want to apply to make it machine readable? What, so there is a lot of very specific questions, but I think the approach would be with use cases. I'm still struggling to find a way in how to showcase the fair principles in action in a workshop. I, don't, I haven't found like an easy access point there. And also on any fair principles website, any organizations who promote the fair principles have any specific examples. Okay, so yeah. I've come across. So what's your experience there? Yeah, I, th I think I understand what you're saying. And I think this comes uh, stems from the fact that the fair principles are uh, principles, <laughs> indeed, and they are completely agnostic from technical implementation. Um, and this is a strength, and it's a weakness at the same time. I believe it's a strength because um, they provide a conceptual framework, which will allow, when you go and you look at the implementation, for different disciplines to preserve their unique, the fact that they have unique challenges and unique needs. So you cannot really come up with, the, you know, let's say a cookbook, 10 recipes, do go from one to 10 and your data is fair. That is very hard to be put down for all the, dis the disciplines and every research project, as you said, will have its own unique distinct challenges. Mm -hmm. So I also uh, found myself and still find myself uh, that it's challenging to provide uh, practical things for, for, for people to actually make their data fair. And this will be very much dependent on their uh, research subject. Um, but, uh, 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 so in this, in a sense, that strength also becomes a little bit of a weakness because it's hard to uh, to tell people how to make that happen for their own research data. But there are some um, common practices or let's say best practices that I believe you can borrow and translate from one discipline to the other. If you think about a persistent identifier, a DOI, that is can be associated no matter what the research object is. 
It is a protocol in the life sciences. It is uh, a survey uh, from social sciences. Uh, it is a survey from the political sciences. Anything that, you know, it's a box that contains something that can have a DOI, a persistent identifier. Um, but to go back also to what you were saying about uh, how do we make sure that then researchers do this, uh, I think the answer is that we shouldn't expect researchers to be able to do everything. Yeah, and it, it's, it, uh, it's just not possible. It's not possible for a researcher to be able to do everything or to be able to have the energies and the time to do everything. Come up with the research hypothesis, write down their grant, actually uh, sustaining their funding, doing the, the research, writing the articles, doing the reviews. Reviewing for other people, sitting into promotion uh, committees. Already I mean, getting dizzy, can you stop? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, well, how press, many things? Like, it's impossible. It's like, there's a lot. And now, now, okay, we come up with these beautiful fair principles. The last thing we need to do is to go to researchers and tell them, here, study the principles and come up with a way to make all your data compliant to this. What? People would scream. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know and they don't have the time to do this. And some people are not equipped and they don't have to be equipped. Mm. If you need to do a research data management plan, you cannot expect somebody that has never looked into managing a data box to be able to go and fill in uh, all the fields in there as if they know how to do that. Yeah, I'm getting so, a heart rate when I even think of it. Like I'm it's, it's, we need support. There is support. There has there is a shift in how we do research. There needs to happen a shift in how we assess research. But I still have to see people come, you know, stand up and saying we need to support researchers in what they're doing. And I understand that uh, you know money is scarce, as we said before, and that uh, competition for these resources is high. I don't think it's possible to transition to full open or fair principles if we don't invest in human resources. We need to open up jobs for people to be able to support researchers to mm -hmm. do this. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's, um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think a lot of the money can also be liberated again. Mm -hmm. um, if publishers and journal editorial teams acknowledge their original purpose and existing in the first place, meaning for me, the value that they add is on the curation level because the peer review they merely manage they write emails to researchers hey can you look at this study because you yeah. have expertise i mean they don't do that like hour long work themselves they coordinate it which in itself is a bit of work i agree but again like that's that that's that's still a matter of like maintaining a database of I don't know hundreds of researchers and then going through the list and emailing them and this can also be automated so it's easy. But what I see journals and edit and publishers do less and less of is the curation of the research to yeah to 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 build collections based on themes and topics. Mm -hmm. We have climate change ravaging this planet. We have peace and like more like peace and stability and conflicts and wars ravaging this planet and hum humanity we have water scarcity we have ocean acidification we have all kinds of globally um global challenges to deal with and we have a globally connected digitally connected scientific community so so we need everybody to think again, including the publishers and, and editorial teams, like what is our, what, what are we good at? What can we actually serve best at? Mm -hmm. And I think journals are here to, to curate information that's coming in. I, I don't know, I, I don't think it was my idea, but um, it's, it's quite recent that I had a discussion and then, and I just want to pitch this further. Like the idea where now researchers are pitching to, or are actually paying a lot of money to get published in certain journals, can we revert that and have, <laughs> have researchers publish Green of an Access in repositories and on the website and in institutional repositories or preprint servers, wherever? So the research is readily available. Journals and publishers can look at that through machine reading. They can have automated processes to curate content and then pitch to the, to the researchers, hey, 
what do you consider us to publish your work? And here's what we offer. And then again, okay, how would they then make revenue? Because they would rather have to invest in scholarly infrastructure. Um, but also for some years to come, I think they could because they've built the revenue of the past mm -hmm. year or two. Um, <laughs> but okay, that's not likely to happen. So what then could be the revenue model in this game? But that's also other people already thinking about these scenarios. But I just like the idea for, for journals and publishers to be there for curation and curation only to serve and formatting assistance jobs. They can maybe also outsource some of the services that we saw so uh, dearly need, like you just said, data curation, mm -hmm. data management. I mean, many publishing houses already have expertise and, and infrastructure for that. It's just that we don't want to foster monopolies or like yeah. monopoly, we want to have a diversity of, of um, service providers in the system. I was uh, reading an article on The Guardian, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, a very recent one, um, a researcher that uh, was, uh, you know, asking, should we get rid uh, of journals or papers uh, altogether, finally? And despite the fact that, uh, you know, I don't particularly, I'm not really a fan of how the publishing system works now, but that is not a surprise anymore. We've established that. Mm. Um, I believe journals have, have, have a meaning, and I believe research articles have a, have a scope, a very specific goal. And as you said a little bit before, uh, um, they tell stories and we need something that tells the final story. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, um, we should find the ways for that story to be enriched with all the other things that, that we know are there. Um, I would love the idea indeed for um, uh, publishers to come to, to researchers and you know tell them, would you like to be featured in our uh, journal and this is uh, you know what we can uh, pay you um, I don't think it's very sustainable and I don't think I will see this type of transformation in my lifetime but uh, who knows <laughs> yeah. who knows yeah I think they can sell services to some degree and then offer payment and others like we also do currently I mean yeah true. How, how the workforce works okay so you and I, we met also working together under the leadership of John Tennant um, mm -hmm. with the Open Science MOOC, which was like we were also on the steering committee together for some time, also promote uh, creating content for some of the modules, which mm -hmm. were out there being utilized, I think three of them. Um, mm -hmm. And then there was yeah, that now, okay, long story short, so now ICTOR, okay, so there's two organizations to talk about for some minutes, so the Open Science MOOC being not so much an, or also an organization of some sort, but more a, an educational platform, I think it was conceptualized also as for open science practices, and now ICTOR is I always have to look it up, even though I'm a member myself. The Institute, the Institute for, for Globally Distributed Open Research and Education. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Now, <laughs> yeah. It's just so very long. Um, brain capacity. By the time I have the second word outspoken, I forgot what, what the other letters were. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, and ICTOR is now adopting or has um, announced sort of adoption of the Open Science MOOC. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let's maybe talk a little bit about how far we've come with bringing the Open Science MOOC to life and what's to come now that ICTOR is, is continuing the, the operation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, as I hear you asking the question, I'm trying to think when, uh, um, John had the first idea for the Open Science MOOC. I don't remember the year. I know that I've been through my emails, my correspondence with him a not long time ago, and I still find I still found these letters that we basically wrote together with Evo, John, me, and Evo. I think it was 2018 um, or the end of 2017. Um, asking people, hey, we want to build a platform for people to actually learn open science. Can you give us money? <laughs> <laughs> and spoiler alert, we didn't get any money. 
Um, but uh, we did form uh, the Open Science MOOC. Um, you talk about like a platform, but for me, what, what the MOOC has always been was a community initiative. Yeah, we also had um, discussions around what, because the word or the yeah. comes from Massive Open Online Chorus, which originally yeah. was a good format for this to take shape of. And then eventually, I agree. I just said, like, yeah, it was a community. I think it still is a community. There's a like, it is, it is, channel, yeah, like more than one thousand members, um, or maybe hitting two. I don't know. So it's ever yeah, yeah, it's big. I I think that this was also one of the you know the big gifts of John to bring the people together, but then to keep them together. Mm. So the the MOOC was, uh, and, and that's why we're we're uh, both here today somehow, right? Um, uh, the MOOC, yeah, it, it it all started from this idea that if we want people to actually embrace open research practices, we need to be able to tell them how to do the work, right? A little bit what we were saying before, at least the basic on how to get more familiar with what open science is and what it entails in their daily job. Um, we have um, worked on, on a few modules, uh, um, and uh, some of them were already uh, people who'd already enroll uh, in uh, education platform, which unfortunately then shut down. And then, of course, with the um, uh, personal, uh, um, let's say, the, the life uh, uh, episodes the, in, in, in the latest uh, um, years of, of John's life, and then after that, uh, his sudden uh, um, passing away, Everything was put to, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, rather stop. I mean, it was only normal for, uh, for people to uh, gain their energies back and their strength back. To, and, and I speak for myself, for example, uh, I haven't been able to, to do anything or to even look at the MOOC for a couple of years. Um, you know, the, the, the pain and the, I was too hard to thinking about it and thinking about John. Uh, but now we have finally um, uh, the, the last steering committee, and the current steering committee of, of the project has asked IGDOR to, if IGDOR as an institution, as a virtual hub for, uh, you know, that promotes open and um, uh, collaborative research practices, would be willing to adopt the project and to give it a, a house for governance and for future and for further development. And IGDOR is more than happy to do that. So we have now formed uh, um, a little education working group within IGDOR. Most of the people in this group, uh, uh, including me, are IGDOR affiliates. Uh, some are not. They might consider joining IGDOR in the future. It doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, this will be, there will be some work put into the Open Science MOOC because um, I believe it's still very valid and it's still very relevant to have some uh, you know, even if it's a, a, um, a GitHub uh, book uh, that uh, people can read if they're interested in uh, open code rather than uh, open data or fair data. But it's also for me, of course, on a personal uh, uh, level, uh, a way to, to honor uh, uh, John's memory and John's legacy because uh, um, he, has, he has done a lot for the field. He has done a lot for uh, open science, for the community. And the least we can do, I think, is to bring forward uh, to future development to what he has uh, initiated. Yeah, totally. And his vision was also always to keep the educational resources with the Open Science MOOC free of charge. Um, like now that we talked a little bit about money, is there a plan already, or is basically probably also what's being worked at currently how to sustain? the because development is going so quickly in the open science era also because much is so much tech based and technology de develops mm -hmm. or is being developed rapidly um but also ICTOR is a strong community and very much tech affine with many data scientists also as members not only so i'm, I'm also mm -hmm. not a data scientist but a ICTOR member <laughs> um yeah, and and that's also what I remember the conversations went around. So how can we sustain this? Because there's so much work going into it. Eventually, some of us will exhaust ourselves because we, I mean, everybody, that's, that's what I usually say for being an entrepreneur or even also for employed researchers. There's so much time we can invest on a voluntary basis. 
Um, so is there a way to institutionalize that with an institution like no ICTER, but then it can also, there's also funding opportunities, there's service opportunities that can be leveraged for groups. I think there's many ways to monetize on a sustainable matter, not to, yeah, without, and, and still keeping yeah. it free for individual users. I think that's basically where I'm heading. Yeah, indeed. We have to we have to start working towards uh, this type of sustainable development. Indeed, we are scouting for funding opportunities, and uh, um, it's only true that there is this amount of voluntary work everybody can do. Um, and this makes me think again of what John used to say: at the end of the day, what matters the most is your physical and mental health. And that means that open science tasks need to go to hell for a day or a week or a month. Well, they can go to hell. There's nothing more important that you, than your own personal well-being. This is really, for me, a life-changing lesson I, I learned from him. Yeah, and you nothing also can come left, before that. He left a couple of YouTube videos on only that, like John Tennant's meditation lectures. Yeah, yeah, very much science. Uh, focused researchers focused so as a researcher yes meditate why yeah. you might doubt it but here's why it makes sense <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I was like yeah. just this week that i had also like i had listened to his voice again because listen to recordings or seeing him live and, and recorded presentations just like <laughs> brings all the memories back mm. good answer uh so yeah but i mean the pain is still there but I don't know if it's less. But it's a different one, I guess, at least yeah, for me. I think so, yeah. It's a different thing. Yeah. But I mean, these videos, it's, we have them, we can disseminate them, we, we can or we don't have to watch them ourselves because I think we learned our lessons from John as, as we worked and were lucky to work with him and call him a friend for some time. and. Others are yet to benefit from from learning from him directly through these um, recordings and and projects that he initiated, and many of which he also finished and produced actual outcome that served mm -hmm. open science at large. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, any concluding remarks? Like, what's your personal mission with open science moving forward in your career? What do you see yourself in the next three to five years? Um, I don't know if open science is still part of my career. For me, it's really mostly um, really advocacy that I do, and, and most of it, it's uh, yeah, I don't make money out of this. <laughs> um, what I would like to see is um, some work being done to actually make it become a reality. Um, so I think I'm going to follow close, uh, um, if possible, uh, um, the actual work on the implementation of the Open Science uh, UNESCO recommendation. Mm. Um, and also on the training part, uh, um, I really would still want to work on the MOOC and um, you know, make sure that that community stays alive and uh, actually produce outcome that can be used by everybody. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It might sound a little bit vague that I don't have uh, a clear vision. I mean, I, I would like many, many things uh, to happen, but most of them are just desires. And I don't think I will have the, the leverage of um, the courage <laughs> to make them happen. Um, I want to keep uh, listening to the different voices. For me, that's, that's very important. And then I think what you're doing with this podcast is really nice because Indeed, it's access to perspectives. No, it's 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 a channel. It's a bridge uh, um, that connects many people, many backgrounds, many experiences, different parts of the world. For me, open science without this uh, means nothing. Mm. So I would like to keep listening to all these different voices and uh, keep learning, become a better person, uh, set the example whenever possible, and make my mistakes. Yeah, because it's part of life and it's human. Absolutely. Can't be free mm -hmm. of making mistakes. As long as we aim at least to learn from them, I keep repeating some mistakes in my life. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe because I don't <laughs> see them as mistakes. Isn't this the, also, I don't know, what's, what sometimes presents itself as a mistake or something counterproductive might actually be the right thing. It's just not the right time to unfold. Yes. 
<laughs> so I think the important thing is to keep asking why and then questioning the status quo is what John did big times and also encouraged like us too for sure and many others to to do more strongly on more mm -hmm. like with a straight back and um, put your foot down kind of approach <laughs> yeah. yeah to speak up for justice is what I learned like whenever like as John was one of a few people only who I have as role models to actually speak out when, when we witness injustice at whatever level, institutional, um, systematic, individual, like, I mean, yeah, injustice will always be there. There's always an equity in some, there's also a natural law, speaking as a biologist here, but as long as there's even the world, we also need a counter force and positiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, where would we be as human beings? So, yeah, I mean, we, we'll be in touch and you're welcome back to this show whenever you feel like you wanna speak up. Um, and thanks for, for making time for this today. Thank you so much for having me.